Hello, governor. Sorry. I'm filming today's video live over on Twitch. If you're watching this at a later date and you want to see videos, uh, that I'll be doing videos like this in future where I do them live so people can join in in the chat. Uh, yeah, check me out on Twitch. It's cam underscore wolf. Today, I am doing something pretty fun. A little while ago, I sent a bit of a call out to you guys. I asked you what your uh, least favorite, like, cliches, tropes, that kind of thing are in writing and you guys delivered you came back you gave me like I'm looking here at like 54 54 comments uh, shit 54 comments so what I'm gonna be doing today uh, on the stream or the video if you're watching this later is I'm going to be reading through these giving you my opinion and uh, we'll go through it like that the first comment I've got is from uh, key knee Hope I, hopefully I said that right and they said, sexual appeal written when describing underage kids. Often authors write women as extremely young and forced to want it, like a girl who is very young, uh, and because of politics, she needs to marry someone to save the family. Guess we're diving head first. Just gonna go right into a right into a bit of an intense one there. That's obviously pretty concerning <laughs> under any circumstances. I think I think what Key is referring to here is a lot of times in more so like fantasy stories, they'll kind of dig into the medieval kind of archaic trope of children being married off basically, or princesses or princes at a young age, usually like around, you know, 16 to 17, hopefully not younger than that. In some instances, I guess it can get a little bit younger and they'll get married off to someone who is older. Depending on the story, it might be someone who's like kind of a young adult. Uh, that's where it usually goes into these romantic plot lines or in more concerning cases quite older person it, it is quite odd that in a lot of cases a romantic relationship that in real life like let's say uh, you know in real life there's a 16 year old dating like a 25 year old most people would see that as pretty I keep saying concerning but that's the perfect word to describe that I would be concerned. The next one is from Neil, Cogn Neil Cognito. It was all a dream or it's worst variation. It was all fake because of mel mental illness or something. Absolutely makes my blood boil. And you can always see it coming from a mile away. There has not been a single instance where they've done the it was all a dream thing and I haven't called it pretty early on. And as soon as you identify that that's the direction that the story's going in, you feel less invested in what's actually happening because you know that it's it's like fake, it's not real. Like yes, it may very well contribute to that character's like, character arc. How are you meant to feel like any kind of emotional connection, even in retrospect, for a story that effectively didn't really happen, you know? Miss Edge 102 says, uh, a love angle. It's not even a love triangle like everyone calls it. It's one person having to choose between two people. So if you draw it out, then it's an angle and not a triangle. An actual love triangle would be interesting where all three people have a thing for each other, but love angles, nah. Uh, myself, no, I'm, you know, I'm not a fan of love triangles, but I don't think they're a bad story device. The only reason I'm not a fan of love triangles, at least anymore, is just because we've seen it so many times. And Miss Edge is right. It is in most cases two different characters opposing uh, rivals going after one person. So yes, technically it's it's like love V, if anything. But that in itself is an interesting concept. The problem is that it's been overdone uh, so much, and not even just that it's been done so much, but it's been done so much in the exact same way. That's, that's where this love triangle fatigue has come from. The whole love triangle thing is literally a meme now. It's so overused, it's so, it's such a cliche, it's such an unpopular cliche that the love triangle thing is literally a meme. Next one is from Greener Side of Sam. This is for the sci-fi dystopian lovers out there. When a chosen teenager saves the world from infinite doom, you know what I was doing as a teenager, crushing on boys and playing Skyrim. I, I get being sick of it. I also get why it's a thing because that's that's the ultimate uh, escapist fantasy for teenagers is being more special than they actually are, you know. And what could possibly be more special for a teenager than saving the world? You know, um, Tainted Crimson says, I love the trope as a teenager, but now I'm a jaded adult who was over <laughs> Yeah, 100%. That's me too. I feel like I'm way too cynical for that now. When I was the age that like most of these teenagers are in these like, you know, books where they, where they fight a corrupt government and save the world, I'm pretty sure that was my Yu-Gi-Oh phase. <laughs> 
particularly annoyed lately with what I call the glorified babysitter trope. Female badasses reduced to babysitting a man-child. Um, in defense of that trope, if I can just play devil's advocate for a minute. I think the reason that happens so much, uh, let's say Guardians of the Galaxy for example, is because one of the most quotation marks endearing trait or personality for a male character, especially a male protagonist, to keep the story interesting, is for them to be like a kind of hopeless goofball, you know, like Peter Quill. And all of the time, Gamora is the one sorting shit out and taking care of him. So I think that's how it, how that uh, trope keeps popping up anyway, is because authors keep making their male protagonists uh, goofballs, which I don't think is an issue so much, but um, I, I get what Rose in the library is trying to say. Aditya says, uh, I face palm when the author shoehorns romance where it's mostly lust and no chemistry between characters who'd be better as friends. That's a really good point. Platonic friendships are underrated in fiction, especially between different sexes. That is an opinion I've had for so long now because it's so absolutely true. So many books you'll see, you'll have two characters that have a lot of chemistry as friends rather than you know, lovers, but there seems to be some kind of obligation in storytelling that if they happen to be uh, you know, romantically compatible being that, uh, you know, if that is the case, generally the storyteller feels like they need to, like, get together romantically just to tie it up as a loose end, but platonic friendships don't have to be a loose end. I feel like I want to say more on that because it's such a good point, but, um, it's really as simple as that. Uh, a healthy dose of Fran says the bury your gaze trope. Just the title itself is reason enough, but just seeing how little queer represent representation there is and that bury your gaze is so prevalent within it is disappointing. We either are killed for entertainment or for shock, and in the case of Lexa from The 100, to get a new season. Don't think I've even read that many stories where gay people have died, but only because I read a lot of old books, and as we all know, the issue with a lot of old books is that um, gay people either weren't in them at all, or they were like, they were, and you, you know that the author intended them to be, but because of society. We live in a society because of society at the time, they weren't allowed to explicitly point out that the character was in fact gay. Obviously I don't think gay characters should be immune to death entirely, but if your book has like, let's say one gay person, maybe don't kill them off, uh, you know, just for the hell of it, just to motivate another one of the characters. When clearly disturbed, abusive, obsessive, and violent men are portrayed as love interests that the female, female protagonists have to fix, twice as infuriating if they are characterized as sympathetic and never suffer consequences for their actions because their daddy was mean to them once and their jawline is sharp. Um, yeah, good point as well. Here, if I can like throw just the tiniest bit of, bit of shade here, not at anyone in particular, but this is something I've kind of noticed on booktube quite a lot, is that there are a lot of people who will get very heated over a protagonist who has even one character flaw that makes them like morally questionable. I kind of like when characters are morally questionable because it's it makes sense, that's human beings, we are, we all have flaws, no one is perfect. Anyway, I think it's funny when uh, there's booktubers who will say something like, uh, you know, this this protagonist has a minor flaw, so they are in fact not a good character and the author is bad for writing them. However, that same person will go and read a romance book where there's a guy being extremely controlling to an abusive degree, and they'll be like, oh, yes, daddy, and they'll like romanticize the shit out of them, or they'll like, or it's a straight up villain, like someone who literally kills people and kidnaps kidnaps the female interest of the story or whatever, just a bad guy, and they get like super hyped up as well, like, yeah, they're, they're a villain, that's what they're meant to do, and it's okay if you hype them up, but if you're doing that, maybe don't get, you know, all heated over a protagonist who has a few minor flaws themselves. What we're talking about here mostly, I think, is like trashy romance books, and I don't mean trashy in like a mean way, I just mean that's kind of what they're known as, you know, trashy romance, because the plotline's not really anything that's gonna stick with you for a long time, it's just meant to make you horny. <laughs> Sophia Sophia says, when the main character falls for the bad- oh, we were just talking about this. When the main character falls for the bad guy, while also having a friend 
who has a crush on her as the backup. That's just like what we were talking about before with the love triangles. Next one is from Kira Gill. The whole, I'm so ugly, but I have a perfect button nose and beautiful blonde hair and every Eurocentric characteristic known the man. I, I don't really have anything to say on this, except yeah, I agree. I, I feel like uh, everyone that's ever put, picked up a book in their life at this point is completely over the plain Jane trope. You know, a character who thinks they're very plain and ordinary and dare I say even ugly and then for whatever reason every single other character in the world is romantically obsessed with them. Yeah, it's boring and it's bad. It's just straight up bad storytelling. Redemption equals death. Not only is it overdone, but it robs the chance of future storytelling opportunities for characters, i.e. showing said character dealing with the consequences of their past actions and growing from them. That's a really interesting one, actually. What do you guys think about that one? Because I'm a little bit conflicted, if I'm being honest, because I love the whole death redemption thing. I love when and a character who either been a villain or a questionable character in a split moment uh, decides to be good and sacrifices themselves for the hero. I kind of love that, although I do get what uh, Lucy is saying here that it is also kind of cheap. I'm getting deja vu. I feel like I feel like I've spoken about this in a video before. I think I have. I made a whole ass video about uh, villain redemptions <laughs> and just remembering that. Obviously you want to leave like breadcrumb trail of them changing from a bad character or a questionable character to a good character. Uh, Sekhmet McFly says one good deed can't erase all of the bad ones. Absolutely agree. So next one, we'll move on a bit. Uh, next one is a violent caveman <laughs> being the love interest. Then the main character female tries to fix them and make them well adjusted. A caveman? Are you... <laughs> I thought you meant like a literal caveman. <laughs> Bruh. <laughs> okay, I get it. You mean like a... Like a big dumb man. I get it. Okay. <laughs> that kind of... I feel like that harkens back to what we were saying before about like the trashy romances. It's, it's a bit cheap. In theory, that is an interesting story device. But again, like Love Triangles, it's done so insanely often that it's just... It's boring now. Alright, Re10 says... Uh, flashbacks because they throw off the timeline, especially when done too many times. You know what the funny thing is here? Like the ironic part about this? Uh, if you're watching this, Retend, thank you so much for, you know, the support and for buying my book. I really do appreciate that. The funny thing though, <laughs> is that the cliche or the trope that you hate is flashbacks. And then you follow up by saying you got my book. The thing is, my book happens to have quite a lot of flashbacks because the story is about the guy's past. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, not a trope or cliche that I found to be all that common, but maybe that's just not in the stuff that I've been reading or watching, I guess. Leslie Carl says, uh, long-winded exposition dumps from a main character. Yeah, here, yeah, the as you know Bob trope. So what it is, is basically uh, when you have... By the way, I'm not... <laughs> I'm not like... <laughs> I'm not like five foot one, like I probably look like in this webcam pic right here. I just have to have it really high up so that I can have this bar at the bottom here so you can see the comments. Anyway, the point is that as you know, Bob trope is basically uh, in stories when you have two characters talking to each other that both of them should effectively know what's going on, but because the reader doesn't know what's going on, one of the characters will explain it to the other one in a really obvious way, and it's just so annoying. It happens a lot on television. Characters constantly seeing the ghosts of dead relatives and having entire conversations with them. Happens in movies and shows as well. <laughs> All the effing time, yet, ex yet it's extremely rare that it happens in real life. It's a cliche and a lazy way to deal with grief. That's a really interesting one. All right, I agree. I, I thought about it and yes, that is like they've said here, it's a really lazy way to deal with grief. I agree. See that the reason it is like so devastating in at least in these fictional stories when a character dies, in my opinion, or at least for me, my experience as the reader, the reason it's so devastating is because when that character dies, they're gone, they're cut off. You can't say anything more to them. You can't say goodbye. You can't tell them you're sorry for the argument you had last week, it, it's they're just gone, you know? That's why it hurts so much, because there's so much left unsaid. Um, so when they come back as a ghost, I know a lot of people would see that as emotional closure for the character, for the protagonist or whoever, like that's 
almost a reward for them. I feel like it would be so much more pleasing or satisfying for me as a reader if that protagonist, rather than getting to talk to that dead relative again, maybe if they just managed to like accept it, you know, like come to terms with the fact that that person that they cared about or loved is gone. Uh, a male love interest's abusive controlling behavior shown as romantic hard pass. Uh, yeah, we, we chatted about that one before. Uh, when the main character falls in love with the villain abuser because they have reasons for that. <laughs> That's the same. Well, we've talked about that one too. Nothing. There is nothing. I fall in love with everything I read. I know a lot of authors that would love to get in touch with you, storyteller. Chicky Scares You says, when the author forces a romantic subplot just to have a romantic subplot. Yeah, that's kind of like what we were talking about before with plat uh, platonic friendships. Plot holes are the worst. Sometimes when I write, I also want a spin-off which sometimes creates a plot hole. Dreaming about a story and barely remembering it or not being able to describe it. Uh, so the first books I ever put out were like a fantasy series and there was going to be four books in it. I only finished like two of them and I stopped after that because because I was so inexperienced and I thought I knew what I was doing and I thought I was like, I assumed I was a great writer. That's That was my whole issue. Um, because I was so inexperienced, I wrote myself into a corner and I had a ton of plot holes to the point where I literally couldn't uh, write my way out of it and I ended up having to kill the series. The trope of easy love, it's so rampant in YA and in most adult fiction nowadays. I think what Jan is saying here is they're not a fan of the love at first sight cliche. Think about it practically, love at first sight isn't, it, I mean, it really can't be a thing. All it is is attraction. You're physically attracted to someone. Um, McFly says love at first sight is lust. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I agree. Um, MC Thomas says, describing the setting in too much detail. Yes, I want to be immersed in the environment, but I also want to move along with the story. I don't want to read three to four pages every single sensory detail in the scene. Incidentally, MC Thomas would not be a fan of Jay Kristoff's writing. Like, I'm not saying he's a bad writer, it's just his style, and it's okay. Sometimes it gets a little bit frustrating, but Jay Kristoff, author of like Nevernight and uh, Illuminae and all that has some of the just the fl most flowery language and not only will he like go out of his way to extravagantly uh, describe like everything but he will also leave like footnotes that give you like a literal whole mini side story like flash fiction about the history of like a jug that was on a table that the character walked past it was just I don't like the good guy never dies. It destroys the suspense when you know the fail that failure is not an option. I, I get what I get what Bryce Talks is saying, like plot armor around the protagonist, but at the same time, especially if we're talking about a series, I think we all just kind of accept the fact that character's not gonna die because the series can't continue if if they do. On the flip side, you've got uh, you know like survival horror that kind of stuff where they all change main characters. They'll uh, switch up constantly. Hey, Sigda writes. Nice to see you, thanks for the follow. Eleni Jurerick says, the female, you know, you know damn well, it's mostly females here. Uh, lead written to have an amazing personality while she has very obnoxious flaws. Instead of leaning on them to make an interesting character, the narrator just slips those under the carpet and every surrounding character keeps par parroting how awesome a uh, female main character is while ignoring all those flaws. Yeah, that's like what we were talking about before when we were talking about, uh, you know, like villain redemptions. We we're talking. I was talking about uh, protagonists having flaws and being hated for that, despite the fact that having flaws is what makes us so quintessentially human. The femme fatale spy. This one was good the first time. Now it's just annoying and serves as a convenient way to sex up the story. That's something I've never really thought about that much. Charlie's Angels is probably a way better example, but female uh, action heroes that use sex appeal to trick or manipulate the enemy. James Bond did the same thing, you know, like the dude version. Some of the stuff that old James Bond did in those old films was like borderline sexual assault. I'll just leave it at that. Sierra says, definitely the uh, messianic archetype, as well as religious overtones that you see in a lot of fantasy stories, especially within the classics. I gotta tell you, that is something I have never even thought about. Not even once. 
because that just would have gone straight over my head, uh, the religious overtones, I mean. I, I saw that with like Gandalf coming back as Gandalf the White, I was like, okay, obviously that's like, that's like an allegory for Jesus Christ, obviously, but I'm not like a religious guy, so I'm, I'm not gonna dig my heels too much into that one. I don't know if it has an actual name, but the introvert goes on a quest and when they get back, they're not introverted anymore. <laughs> Being introverted isn't something that can be like, just cured you know, by going on an adventure. Yeah, you, you probably will get more confident. Obviously, like, taking classes and public speaking, that kind of thing, does help a lot of people. But I don't think it's going to change your personality entirely. So Amy says, when the hook of a story is a woman trying to overcome her struggles, but it turns into a cliched romance, and she realizes what she needed all along was the perfect man, and her struggles magically vanish. We've talked a lot in this video already about pretty much the entire idea of a uh, woman being a damsel in distress in pretty much every form or shape it can possibly take. Theo says, crime thrillers with the unforeshadowed multiple personality trope where the protagonist is revealed as the culprit all along. It feels lazy just to flip a switch on a narrator as suddenly being cunningly manipulative sadistic mastermind. I get why that's a popular or interesting story device, because it is, it's super interesting thinking about uh, the twist being that the protagonist was a split personality villain the entire time. However, that's the kind of thing you can only really read about once. The next one is from bric a -brac. They say, uh, when the description is purple just to be purple. I, I imagine they're talking about like purple prose, which is like what we were talking about before with very flowery or poetic language just to overly describe stuff like, you know, rather than just saying the character walk walked into the room, they'll describe how every uh, step was like stepping onto a cloud or something. I don't know. I'm not Jay Kristoff. I can't I can't just flip it off the tongue, you know. Next one is Jarrett Mutton says teenage outcast bad boy quotes classic literature. It's just very few people do that. It takes me right out of the story. Yeah. You know what that is in stories where there's like the the young kind of uh, bad boy, if, if you want to call him that, who, who like reads classic literature and quotes it and they listen to like, you know, old school music. Like I Feel like I, I kind of listen to old school music but you get my point usually the author in these instances is like a middle-aged dude you can tell they've just injected themselves into this protagonist like it's kind of like a fantasy they're writing themselves as a young bad boy who's like into classic literature and stuff and what it ends up doing is it just creates the I'm not like other girls boy version and it's just like it's just cringe you know like cringe cringe alert cringe dream sequences that's another good one. That's like, yeah, like we were talking about before with the, it was all a dream. When a girl's call to adventure is to follow a boy that they've broken up with, uh, recently met with to win their heart. Like no one is seriously that desperate to be romantic, right? Especially if it's life or death. I'd run from that boy no matter how hot he is. I, just once I would like to read a book where there's like a romantic relationship, but danger appears. And one of them's just like, yo, fuck this, dude. Like, I, I don't want to die. Like, you're cool and everything. Hell, I might even love you, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not fucking with that. Philip Hawkins says, anything where the problem is solved, uh, enemy is defeated with positive thought, especially if it's group positive thought. <laughs> Do you mean like the heroes all like hold hands and just like, I don't know. I don't know what, uh, no examples come to mind for this one. I'm not really sure. The Nihilist Geek says dreams either as a start or in the middle or as a twist in the end. It is, yeah, okay. All right, we, we talked about that one too, come on. Tyler Butcher says more of a sci-fi trope, but uh, unified planetary governments. One of my pet hates when I read about like sci-fi is in like planetary intergalactic sci-fi, whatever, is when there's like a president of an entire planet. That, it, that itself is such an alien concept to us as humans that it's just not realistic, especially when it's like the president of the human race, and it's always an American, <laughs> keep in mind. Back into a bit of a darker topic, I noticed how the R word is getting more and more popular as a plot device, and I think it is really danger dangerous, especially if it is to motivate the male main character while the victim and her arc gets left behind. Don't take this as me like defending it. I'm gonna say I get why it's prevalent in fantasy, but at the same time, I agree that it's not necessary. I feel like the reason that the authors of fantasy are writing so much like, you know, women getting, I'm not gonna say the word, but R worded in those stories is because they're like, oh, you know, in old European times, the women were the most vulnerable because that's just how the class structure was built the best way for that author in their opinion mind you the best way for that author to make you hate the villain is to make them do the worst thing possible which 
in a lot of cases is the R word. Again, I'm not defending it, I'm just saying that seems to be why they do it. The whole normal person is introduced into a fantasy world but doesn't believe at first trope. I understand it's realistic, but it's so boring to read again and again, especially when the author stretches it out over 50 plus pages. We don't, we don't want to spend <laughs> forever reading about a character that's, you know, been dropped in a fantasy world and is just refusing to accept it. Chosen One. I'm surprised it took this long for the chosen one to pop up. I can't, it's kind of a guilty pleasure for me. I hate that. I would hate it uh, if I read like two fantasy books in a row and that was the plot device on both of them. I would be like, oh god damn it. But I do enjoy a good chosen one story every now and then. I'll admit. Next one. I don't hate zombie and alien tropes, but I don't super love it. I don't know if it's a trope, but just want to add. Uh, I don't like love tropes and love stories in general, except in a fantasy or a horror. Love tropes and love stories, obviously not for everyone. Uh, using sexual assault or near sexual assault as a romantic plot device. Yeah, we were just talking about this one as well. Um, no one wants to... No one wants to bang after es after escaping a Pulp Fiction dungeon. In reality, they don't want to bang after you've saved the day. They just want to go home. They want to they want to get home to safety. I hate the implication that having bad uh, decisions and actions characters makes a book bad. Get this, people do bad things. Some books are written explicitly to display bad behavior in people, and a large portion of readers don't seem to understand that that's that doesn't make a book a bad book. That is exactly what I was talking about before when I was talking about morally ambiguous characters. I hate the falling underwater epiphany seeing dead loved one a slow mo arty pretentious plot device. They don't feel that effective and frankly a little bit over the top. Yeah, that's like we were talking about before, um, you know, with seeing the ghosts of your dead relatives. It's kind of like a lazy way for the character to um, find closure in grief rather than having to just accept it. Uh, accept, accept reality for what it is that they are gone. So that's it. That's all of the comments that you guys gave me in regards to writing cliches that you hate. Not necessarily me, although I agree. I agreed with you uh, for most of those. I'll be doing this more often. Uh, obviously, I get a lot of audience input for my videos as it is, but in the future when I do videos like this where I get you to give me suggestions and stuff, I think I'm gonna just film it live so I can chat with people in the actual chat here like I have been doing here as well. I just think that's a lot more fun, a lot more interactive. Much love.